bow, although I had one for 30 years, uh, my first 30 years of my marriage. No, I would say 40 years of my marriage. I had <laughs> Really? Yeah, so, right. you know. Really? Going back to my old self. Okay, we are live. Hate to, sorry to interrupt, but we are live on YouTube. And it is. All right, it is. Time to go. 601. Yep. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey, hey. Hello. We're gonna officially Lisa, I just say, Lisa got kicked off and James is trying to get her back on, but she, she's listening. So. Okay. All right. So is everybody here? Have we got, I got to put my little screen on there. There we go. There's George. Okay. Good. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Beverly, I think uh, you have the invocation next week. Um, if I'm correct, uh, and we'll need to do all the usual things, approval minutes and all that. Um, we'll approve the agenda. Don't really have any committee reports. I, well, actually we may, the, um, I don't know if Stephanie wants to talk a little about the, um, meeting that we had about school lunches. Is she on? She's Who's not. It? No, she. No, no, no. Goodness, the thing is she had travel problems. Yeah. Okay. Well, if she okay. wants to do that, we can discuss that next um, Tuesday also. So okay. we'll go on up uh, and nope. go from there. Okay. Nobody's requested to appear before the board. Not at this time. And I all right. I guess that's going to bring up Dr. Green for a support services report. If he has, is, I think I saw him here. I am here, Ms. Stevens. Um, the communications report is posted for your review, and I have no further comments on that unless someone has questions. Okay. Any questions from anybody? Is that it for you, Ken? Yes, ma'am, that is for now. You'll get me again later. <laughs> okay, I'm sure. All right. Uh, Miss Houston, are you online? With us? I am online. Okay. All right. My first uh, report is the invoices between 10 and 24,999. We had three of them this month. One is to Tech Optics, was paid out of ELOS funds for $10,419.30. It was for uh, Mitel controllers for the alt school and phones for Bear Creek Middle School. So really it was the phone systems at alt school and Bear Creek Middle School. The second one was to commercial controls. It was paid out of the general fund for 21,696. And it was for direct digital synthesis control upgrade. Um, this is a maintenance expense and it's to upgrade the EMS EMS control systems at Bethlehem Elementary School. The last one was to WMJ Redmond and Sons. This was a CT paid for out of a CTA grant reimbursable for $24,172. And it was for a laser engraver. And that was for Winder Barrow High School's the engineering class over there with Kimberly Guerin. Okay, great. Anything else? That's it for that. Um, I was just going to go over the um, budget timeline that we really don't have a timeline for, but um, just wanted to go over it every every month with y'all. Um, if you scroll down just a, a tad bit, um, we, we were on fire up until about March 13th, and then um, COVID happened. Uh, so uh, we are just kind of waiting on the state right now to give us our allotment of funds so we can make some decisions with the budget with our expenditure side. Um, so we're at the, the first green section, 26. I'm going over the budget timeline with y'all. Uh, the tax commissioner gave me the uh, tax digest last week. So we'll be going over the millage rate a little bit later and making some decisions on that. Um, and like I said, the work session millage rate presentation will be today. We'll do also do a spending resolution. So I'll present y'all with a spending resolution. That's 
can't complete a budget, um, we'll do a spending resolution for one month. And so I'll go into more detail at the um, later on in the meeting about that. And so we may pass a, a tentative millage rate uh, on June 2nd. We may not. We're going to talk about that. And we should be passing, uh, adopting a spending resolution for the month of July um, next week. And then everything else is really to be announced. We're just waiting on um, the state allotment of funds. And then whatever we decide to do the millage rate, we'll fill in some of these dates and hopefully get the millage rate approved and done by July 28th. Uh, we have a deadline from the uh, the county. So we need to get that done as soon as possible, but we'll make some decisions um, later on in the meeting. And that's it for that. All right, anything else at this time? Not at this time, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joe Perno. Hey there, Joe everybody. Yeah, so for our report tonight, just giving an update on our construction projects. And we've got a handful of photos there, maybe maybe too many, I don't know. But um, the hardest part of any project, the hardest parts, yep. the start and the finish. And uh, the last four or five percent are really, really tough to get at. But we're making good progress on that front there at BASA particularly here over the last week, really starting to get things cleaned up and you know, creating that sense of urgency to have the contractor uh, on out of the way because we've got things to do in there as well uh, with cleanup and furniture and getting ourselves moved in. So um, I don't know if we can scroll through those or, or you all have maybe had a chance to see them, but um, I was over there about an hour ago, and it, and again, these pictures lag a little bit, but uh, it's really coming together nicely there. Um, as far as our other projects, as those scroll th through, I'll just tell you that I know coronavirus has us all hemmed up here at, at the house, but we've been fortunate to have construction continue, and it's given us even a little bit of a jump. Um, for the classroom camera uh, projects and uh, vestibule work that we're doing at our middle schools and high schools. And of course, the full renovation at Statum. Uh, phase two work at Westside and HVAC work at, at Appalachia. So there's a lot going on and it, it's moving along well. Um, again, a big piece for the summer on these vast is getting a lot of the attention, I know, but classroom cameras at our middle schools and high schools, um, vestibules, so you see a picture there at Statham. Several years ago, we put the cameras and the audio piece at the front door, and that was kind of phase one. And phase two, when we go into, into a school to renovate it, that's, that's just a picture of all the storage boxes outside of Statham. We got to move everything out of the building. Um, phase two, when we're in a school renovating it, is we have to we want to harden up those front entrances and create that security vestibule, brick and mortar uh, layer for school safety. So that's what you see in that picture there. Any any questions? There's a lot going on there. A lot of Joe. Joe this is, this is Ricky. Uh, yes, sir. How do you feel about your time frame? We're going if school were to start on time, or we're going. You think we'll be ready? Yes, sir. We feel really good about it. Yeah. Um, again, I, I hate everything that we're having to go through right now, but it, it gave us a little bit extra time there. You know, being in the schools in April instead of May, and so we've been able to capitalize on that. It, it's helped us. There's a west side gym there, the wood floor. The west side corridors, they'll get that stone tile. The HVAC work there at, at Appalachia, all the ceilings are out and 
getting new units up in the in the ceiling there of the original building, as well as the class uh, classroom cameras, and audio. Yeah. A lot of good work there, Joe. A lot of stuff, hey, good Joe. things going on. Looks great. Yeah, we're excited about it. We're really, really happy with everything, the way it's moving. I'm always amazed at how much y'all get done in a little bit of time. You know, 17 years, I, you know, you, you get used to it a little bit, but it's still tough to walk into a school like Statham right now. Appalachia or West Side and just see it sort of taken apart, you know it's going to get there because you, you've seen it happen over and over again, but it still kind of stops you for a second and yep. you kind of you want to run out, but it's it, it's going to really be nice. Yeah, yeah everything looks yeah. great. Yeah, so great. I have a question that Clay had asked. He read something about it and we were talking about it. He wanted the next time you brought it up. Are we putting 5G in any of the schools when we've been doing the upgrades? Well, John said Claire can answer that better than I can, but I, I would just simply say that John normally tags along with us when we open up a ceiling for new lights or HVAC or ca classroom cameras in this instance. He'll jump in there and, and work on the, the network for the school as well. I don't, I don't believe there are any 5G lines, John. You can so 5G is really something that a cellular carrier would be uh, implementing in an area. Um, there, there are upgraded wireless networking technologies that kind of keep pace to increase the kind of bandwidth you get inside a building as compared to 5G for cellular networks. Um, and we do have a regular program where we're upgrading um, wireless uh, as technologies evolve. Right now we're able to support you know, pretty much gigabit um, bandwidth in all of our schools, so great shape right now. But we continue to, to invest in the network infrastructure. Um, we've got um, question right now for some E-rate funding for our next rounds of upgrades that we're waiting on. Okay. Uh, well, I'll save it for later. I was gonna ask about where we are and, and I know that we were able to get Wi-Fi access to a lot of our students John, um, when we had the crisis, was that a temporary thing or can we make that permanent or what can we do about that? So we, we have a couple options. Right now we have um, a, a mini grant from the state. They're supplying us with 16 um, uh, hotspots that we can put on buses and put in various places throughout the, the county to, to support students <laughs> who are in need. We also just received a grant from uh, Aruba, the company that makes our wireless and wire network gear. They're providing us two um, external uh, wireless access points. The, the difference being the hotspot is something that rides on the AT&T cellular network, so it's going to be as good as the AT&T coverage there. The two things we're getting from the Aruba company, will, our uh, access points will go on the outside of a building, and they'll provide a wireless bubble riding off of our network for students to use as well. So we have a couple of things in motion. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, Dr. Moten, I think you're up next. I do not have a formal report, but just to give you a quick update on teaching and learning, we're glad to be um, at the summer break. Uh, we had a lot of uh, good positive things come out of teaching and learning during our remote learning experience. We're taking that information to continue what was successful and um, use it as an opportunity to improve so that we can reach more students and definitely be able to support our teachers as we move to the fall and whatever that may look like from teaching and learning, uh, we'll be ready to go with all of the support that we can provide. Great. Hey, I think Dr. Moten has more Zoom meetings than I do at this point. So. <laughs> Just call me Zoom. That's my new nickname, Zoom. That's it. That's what <laughs> okay. I'm calling you. Yeah. <laughs> um, is, is that it, Dr. Moten, for now? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Beggs. I have nothing at this 
this point, but I'll talk to you a little bit later. All right. Very good. All right. Um, we have under old business the transportation uh, proposal for school year 2020-2021. Dr. Green, you're up. Yes, ma'am. And I want to go over the PowerPoint there. So he'll pull that up to the screen. Before I get to the PowerPoint, I just want to make a few preliminary comments. First, I want to take us back very briefly to our November work session. Um, during that meeting, we kind of discussed this whole process. At that time, we put together a study committee to look at transportation options for the 2020 school year. And we presented to you three questions that were going to guide the work that that committee did. And I just want to remind us all of those three questions. Um, the first was, how can we best meet the transportation needs of students given the continued growth, especially at the middle and high school level? Um, how do we protect instruction time for programs requiring shuttles? And how do we protect teacher planning time, especially at the elementary school level? And that particular question probably should have been reworded to how do we recoup planning time especially at the elementary school level, because frequently planning time for elementary school teachers happens at the end of the day. And because of our difficulties getting buses to the elementary schools within a very short window, then they were losing out on in, uh, planning time and have been for a while. And we'd looked at multiple options prior to the study committee of how to regain that. I bring those three questions back to mind to, to just let everybody know that this is not specifically a BASA thing. It's coincidental that BASA is opening next year at a time when we are um, doing this study and BASA will be affected and was an important part of that. But this is not pre predominantly a BASA issue. Those three questions guided our work and we had a, a wide range of um, goals that we were trying to accomplish. And I mentioned to you um, when we met last week that um, we were not able to accomplish everything as well as we would like, but we ended up with two um, proposals that were workable that we asked you to put on the table um, last month for public feedback, which you did. One other thing that I wanna remind you of from November was that that November work session, we said we were gonna reach out and get public input. We wanted to hear very clearly from um, our parents, our teachers, students and others, um, their input before we delivered to you any kind of final recommendations. So that's the reason we ask you to put two workable solutions on the table um, and that we've spent since you voted to put it on the table uh, last month till now receiving input and analyzing that input. So what I plan to show you in this PowerPoint is the results of the input that we've gotten over the last several weeks. Um, so first, go ahead, Chris, we'll click and on just one second and um, have a tad bit of technical difficulty getting the slides to progress. Just one second. Oh, OK. Well, and while he's getting that to progress, let me just mention to you that we had um, 4,300 plus almost 4,400 responses. You'll see that number here uh, in a minute. And most of the questions on the feedback form were open-ended questions. So you can imagine the amount of time it took the committee to analyze all that written feedback. And so the way we did that was divide and conquer. We divided the uh, feedback responses into groups of 500. And we asked each committee member to go through those 500 responses to all five of the open-ended questions and to compile those into categories and count those that were similar. And then we met and we talked about what we saw there uh, in those comments and kind of came to the conclusion that even though I had say zero to 500 and someone else had 501 to 1000, the comments were repetitive and, and no one had, uh, were noticing comments that were really different from what the other committee members were reading in their 500 comments. And so they were pretty, um, pretty well grouped into categories that we then compiled, and I'll go over those and put those on the slide uh, in the slideshow for you to view tonight. You all having trouble, Chris? Mm -hmm. 
would you like me to share my um, version of the PowerPoint? And that may be the best way. I don't know if we've gotten some kind of a broken link here. Um, All right, let me see if James I can. Is typing furiously over here. But, uh. <laughs> okay, uh, let me see if I can get this. Uh, it's disabled for me to share mine. So we'll let James have, an, have a end at it. <laughs> That's a good idea, Ricky. What's he doing? Holding it up. Holding it up. Ken, if you want to just talk us through what what's on your slides, you could do that while we're working on it. Yes, ma'am. I'll be glad to do that. Um, you can each of you individually can open up and follow along in the PowerPoint. Um, I just wanted to first go back and remind everybody of the two scenarios that were placed on the table. One labeled scenario one was basically a flip from what we're doing now with elementary going in on the first tier, middle and high school going in on the second tier. BASA would go in at, in the morning with elementary um, on their own dedicated bus routes. And then in the afternoon, the BASA students would shuttle to the high schools and would go home um, in the evening on the middle school, high school buses. So that was scenario one. Scenario two, you'll recall, was the one that was most similar to what we're currently doing. There were some significant adjustments to the elementary school schedule in particular, um, but this scenario two still had middle and high school in the morning on tier one with about a 10 minute earlier start time than we have this year. Um, BASA would, BASA would ride in on the middle and high school buses, would get on shuttles, would shuttle over to uh, BASA and would repeat the process in the afternoon. And then elementary school, we pushed the start time back mainly to accommodate the afternoon end time so that we could um, both try to reduce the length of their day, but also get the buses lined up so that that, that, that window of bus arrivals in the afternoon would not be as, as big as it has been for the last couple of years. So, oh, there it is, I see it. All right, well, can we go to the next one then? There we go, okay. So um, we had a total, at the time I pulled this report, which was on Thursday at 6.25 p.m., we had 4,360 responses. And so all the rest of the slides that you're gonna see are based on these 4,360 responses. Since Thursday at 6.25 PM, we have had 36 additional responses. Um, and so I just simply didn't have time to get this updated for your review and wait until today um, to pull those. But I did check and the overall, um, feel for those additional 36 uh, responses haven't really changed any of the data that you're going to see coming up. So just know that 4,360 responses as of Thursday at 6.25 p.m. So moving on to the next slide. The first two questions we asked were for folks to identify their affiliation with the school system by role and by level. So we um, we listed the role of student, parent, teacher, administrator, other Barrow County School System employee and community and said, check all of these that apply. In the next question, we said, are you affiliated with us through a connection with elementary, middle, high, or our district? Check all that apply. So you'll notice by the time folks checked all that applied, they were some, many of them were represented in multiple categories. For instance, a parent could have children at all three levels and in that case, they would have been represented as a parent at the elementary, middle, and high. A teacher could be both a teacher and a parent, even of multiple levels. And so that's how these were divided. And you'll see where that comes into play um, towards the end of this presentation. So as I said, we asked five um, open-ended questions. We asked, what do you like? And then what do you dislike about each of the two scenarios? And then we ask, what's the most important concern that you have related to a possible change in the bell schedule transportation options for the upcoming school year? So I'm gonna go through those next. So we'll advance to what do you like about scenario one? Um, so you'll notice that any 
any response that was in a category that had 5% or more of the total responses to that scenario got listed here um, on the slide. Um, there were random other uh, comments that were made, but when we had our committee meeting, there were really no comments that were made that weren't things that we had already discussed. And these were the most common comments that folks were um, making. I won't take the time to read every one of those um, to you, um, but I wanna kind of leave them there um, for you to review. And I do need to go back and make one other general comment before we go too much further. And I apologize, I had a script written out here and I got ahead of myself. I wanna give you a cost comparison between these two scenarios, um, because even though we said last month that we believe that scenario two would be more expensive of the two options, I think a lot of folks saw those eight buses and thought that had to be the, the most expensive option. And quite honestly, that was what I thought of at first, but when we ran the numbers, um, scenario two does look like that it will be the most expensive of the two options. And I'd like to try to explain that. When we say eight new buses, what we mean are eight new routes. So a route consists of a bus, a driver, and then the actual course that they, that they drive. We have the buses. We have enough in our spare fleet to cover the additional eight new routes for a year or two um, at, at least. What we would really incur as an expense by adding eight new routes is the drivers. And so when you take eight routes times the um, average length of day, based on that scenario, then that comes out to be about $213,000. Um, however, scenario two has a bigger gap from the earliest arrival time until the, until the latest arrival time of um, the way it's shown there is 40 minutes. If you take 40 minutes and spread it over 134 drivers, then that adds up a lot quicker than adding eight just eight drivers. And so that cost, and just an estimate, but I think it's a reasonable estimate, probably on the low end of $255,000 over the course of the year um, for uh, scenario two. So 213 estimated for eight new routes versus 255, $255,000 estimated for an extra 40 minutes for all 134 of our drivers. Now, the drivers that we currently have are probably not gonna be making that entry level pay like the new routes would. They're probably gonna be making uh, pay based on their years of experience. So that's why I say that 255,000 is probably low um, because we based it on that beginning pay rate. So having said that, let me just kind of move on to these um, particular slides here. Um, so you see the ones that are uh, there. Um, what do you like about scenario one? You're going to see some of these get repeated. Some people said something about scenario one and some other people said that's exactly what they didn't like. So if you'll flip on over to what do you like, what do you dislike about scenario one? Um, you saw that some people said there's nothing they dislike. They like everything. Um, too early for younger students, and yet, if you'll remember from what people liked, they liked elementary school starting early. This one, they don't like that it's too late for middle and high school students due to sports, but on the previous slide, a group of people said they do like it because it, it's, uh, it takes into account sleep schedules and the later start time for, um, for high school students in particular. Um, and again, the reason I went through that uh, cost analysis is because a lot of folks saw adding additional buses and thought that uh, seemed to think based on their comments that that was the more expensive option. Um, and that's why they didn't like that, although it wasn't actually the most expensive option. So let's move on to what folks like about scenario two. Some folks, as you saw on the previous slide, say they don't like anything about scenario two. Um, others like it because it's, because it's common, it's most similar to what we're doing now. Some like it because they prefer the early start for middle and high school. Some like it because they prefer a later start for elementary school. 
But when you go to the, what do you dislike? Next one. Next one. They're saying the exact opposite. They're saying that this is too late for elementary. It's too early for middle and high. Some people don't like any, don't dislike anything about it. They like everything about it. Um, and then, you know, on and, uh, you know, on and on uh, about this, what they don't like about scenario two. One other factual comment that I want to make is there were several folks that didn't, that um, didn't like what they perceived to be that we would not serve breakfast to BASA students. And I just want to clarify that no matter what scenario ultimately is the one decided upon, BASA students will get breakfast. The comment about it being a con is there's no ready made built in um, time slot to put breakfast on a shortened day for BASA. So they'd have to squeeze it in somehow, probably at the expense of more class time under scenario two, but they're going to have opportunity to eat. Um, that's not something that we're going to take away from them. Um, okay, let's move on to the last open-ended question, which is the next slide. So what concerns you most about possible changes to the bell times and transportation options? And so you'll see the things that really rose to the top for folks, no matter which schedule they preferred. Um, some people said the biggest concern is they don't want an early start for middle and high school and do want a late start and do not want a late start for elementary school. They had transportation concerns. They want to solve overcrowded buses, buses long waits for school pickups. They would like assurance that elementary students would have access to childcare before and after school. And I will assure you, we've always provided um, care. And that is, while that was not a major factor in the, the deliberations of the committee, we did have discussions about that. And we don't anticipate, regardless of scenario, that we would be doing away with um, before or after school care. Um, so that would be an assurance we could give to parents regardless of scenario. Um, and so you see the others that are here. Some people even said they don't, they don't have any big concerns. They're, they're pretty flexible. The other question we ask, and I'm going to cut and dice and show you this in a lot of different ways, was of these two scenarios, which do you prefer? And as you can see here, 59% prefer scenario one, 39% prefer scenario two, and 2% 2 did not provide a preference. That, that was approximately 93 of the total respondents did not, um, did not indicate a preference. Now I will tell you, I started looking at responses the day after this was opened and I looked at them as recently as um, just uh, within an hour of us starting the meeting tonight, and those percentages have not changed. When we had just a couple of, um, I think 73 was the smallest number that uh, the number of people that had taken it when I looked at it the earliest, these percentages were pretty much within decimal places of where they are now. 5939 has been very consistent. But we wanted to try to learn a little bit more about what those percentages might mean. So we went on and um, looked at them by role. So here you can see, a, I mean, by level here first, you can see a breakdown by level. Clearly, elementary school respondents um, preferred scenario one by a larger margin than did middle or high but both middle and high still had a majority of the respondents saying they preferred scenario one. That's much tighter, um, 52 to 46 or 51 to 47 than the previous slide we saw, um, but they still were over 50% in preferring scenario one. So we'll go on and look by role. So here you see it broken up by how were you, how were you affiliated with our school system? Um, and you'll see that parents preferred scenario one by 56 to 42, teachers by 70, 69% to 30. Students were a little bit closer um, at 52, 46. Administrators, now that's a very small number, 41 compared to 
2,700 for parents. So don't, you know, don't think that's the same number of people, but the percentages were 88 to 10. And then other employees, 60, 40, and community was about 63 to 34. And then the yellow at the very end are those that did not uh, choose a preference. So we decided to dig a little deeper. We broke it up by um, role at level. And you'll notice that it took us this deep before we finally had a group that preferred scenario two to scenario one, and that's middle school students. And they preferred scenario two by a 51 to 47 percent margin. Um, every other subgroup um, preferred scenario one, some closer than others, as you can see, cl anything closer to that 50 percent line, but some, um, you know, by pretty significant margins. Um, I will tell you, if you will Give me a second. I didn't really have room on that slide to tell you what administrators had preference, but the high school administrators, there were six of them and they had 67 to 33 preferring scenario one. Middle school administrators was 92 to zero preferring scenario one. The other 8% were left it blank and did not answer it. Elementary school administrators were 90 for scenario one um 10 percent for scenario two so that'll kind of give you the um, breakdown um after analyzing all the open-ended comments after looking at the data that's here um and discussing it with the committee the committee um is at this point given all the factors that we've been discussing since october but more intensely since early march um would like to recommend the following that the Barrow County School System adopt scenario one as presented. So I'll ask now, are there questions that I can answer? Yeah, and I've got one, uh, uh, this is Butch Hub. I've got one about transportation. Um, you say these eight routes, we've got buses to cover the eight routes. Those buses are reserve buses. Um, I know reserve buses are important sometimes. We use them a lot, I think. Um, how, how many more reserve buses beyond eight are we going to have available for use? Right. We currently have a fleet of 208 buses and we currently have 134 routes. So we would take the difference between those uh, and put those buses on the road. Now, let me explain to you a little bit about that situation and why we are in a better situation this year than we were two years ago. Two years ago, we went an entire year with a vacant mechanic position. So we had, um, we were trying to do the work of five mechanics and only had four. So it was very, very difficult to be able to keep up. And a portion of that year, we were also uh, short on a shop foreman. So we were down to four mechanics doing the job of five mechanics and a shop foreman. And so a lot of our buses were what we called nose in, which meant that they were sitting on the lot, they were in the inventory, but we just had not been able to get around to fixing them. We also had some tight budget um, constraints at the end of that year. Um, so between being short a mechanic all year long, being short a foreman for several months of the year, some tight budget constraints at the end of that year, we had a lot of those um, spare buses were nose in. They weren't currently available to us to use. In June, we hired a mechanic. In July, we hired a shop foreman. So we've been fully staffed in our shop this entire year. Um, and we've also been able to manage our budget in such a way that most of those nose in buses have been put back into service. We had our bus service uh, inspections with the state um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, so we're, we're in really good shape with our buses um, right now. And we feel like that that'll carry us for um, at least a year or two uh, before we'll have to have new buses. Primarily, we've been buying buses to try to update our fleet to, to um, keep our fleet uh, fresh and not as old as as it gets when you when you sit and don't replace buses, 
Um, so we think we're in pretty good shape. We just bought four new buses in the fall. Um, so we feel like we're in good shape with the actual buses themselves. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other, any other yes. questions? Um, yeah, I did have a question. Um, on option one, there has been talk that, that um, and when I've heard it out there, that we are given more priority to BASA and I've heard it from teachers and I've heard it um, around in the community and I've talked to some of y'all about it and we've looked and I've looked around I've talked to several of y'all about it I tried to talk to Dr. McMichael about it couldn't get back with him and I didn't know if some of y'all had looked at if y'all had Ken if y'all had looked at maybe possibly an option to get rid of that stigma that we're giving boss a, a I guess an elite you know, we've heard that that's where the elite, and we know that we open that school up to the one best of the, things, of the best. One of the things, if, and I don't know that if we looked at that that zero period as being an elective. You know, if we're going to go with option one as being the you know the kids that have to ride the buses because that was one of the things that that we're having to do it to get buses to here and there, and if the kids that do have transportation can start at the same time as the regular high schools do, get rid of that stigma that we're doing something special for BASA that we're not for the others. Because some of them are saying, well, if we do that and we're going back to this other schedule because high schoolers need their sleep, which we know the studies do show that, that the middle and high schoolers need more sleep, that if we make that zero period, an op, you know, not a mandate, but an optional period, that if you can get your own transportation there, because we know as we start adding more, you know, down the road, as we start adding more students, we're gonna have more students driving to that school. And, you know, then that would alleviate that. But if you have to have transportation, then it's not, you have to actually be in a class and do that. Have we thought about doing something like that? And then that gets rid of that stigma that we're doing something special for BASA that we're not for the other high schools. Yeah, um, we talked about it a little bit at the last work session. You know, the buses would have to arrive on the schedule that we have there, uh, as you acknowledged, um, to be able to turn around and go back out and pick up their second tier route. Um, we would certainly have the option to be able to um, have that first period voluntary. I'm not entirely sure that that's going to be an easy thing to um to be able to supervise on campus with students arriving at, at lots of different times. And Dale would be a better one to answer that. You know, we, but we did discuss that very thing at the um, work session um, in the end of April was that, and I believe Dale's comment was that he would prefer that students um, arrive at the same time because of ease of supervision. Um, what we've actually been trying to do is not make BASA the special child, but to make them something other than the redheaded stepchild because we've been trying to just make sure that BASA had equivalent to the two high schools. Um, one of the things that we did by providing transportation is it made it accessible to anybody who wanted to go there. There's no admission criteria to go to BASA. Anybody that um, chooses to, to go is eligible to go and transportation is not an option. So that's one of the things that we've been working really hard to do is to take away that transportation um, barrier uh, for BASA and make sure that they had instructional time that was at least equivalent to the two high schools. Um, and the options were either they're going to have less time or more time. There really was no workable solution that they could have the exact amount of time. And so one option gives them more. And Dale kind of went over how he would use that time with them. Um, one time gave them significantly less. And we, I, I think there was pretty strong sentiment on the committee, at least, that they not have less time than the high school students at the traditional high schools. All right, any other questions? All right, we'll be ready to vote on that um, next Tuesday. Okay, I, I take it, uh, 
Dr. Michael, that your your recommendation is that we go with scenario one. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, I've and I think most of y'all know I've been on both sides of this one. Um, I've gone back and forth a good bit over the last time, the other times we've done it and this time, but I just don't, after looking at the totality of everything, I just, I think it's the best solution. I, I hate the timing of it. I think it, um, but again, this is a project we started back at, towards the beginning of the year and um, we, I think we have to follow through with it. So that, that will be my recommendation to the board. Ms. Ms. Stevens, uh, Butch up again. I, I, I just like to make a couple of comments. I put in a lot of time with this and I've lost a lot of sleep over trying to decide which way I want to go here. Um, and I, just some general comments about some of the things I see here. Um, I, I believe completely in the, the arguments that academic performance in, in high school and middle school is better if they have a late start. There's no question that that exists. I don't think there's enough information out there to show that it applies to elementary schools, but we know that high school and middle school does make a difference. Early starts for earlier starts for elementary school may not matter, but there is that argument. One thing about moving high school late is the same same old story we've said many many times is that it's going to impact sports and after school activities, which have as strongly as sleep is associated with improved academic performance. I think associations with sports and extracurricular activities are probably just as strongly associated with academics and high school graduation rates. So we, we got to be aware of that when we make this change, that, that it's going to impact that at the high school level. And, and there has been some concern. I just quoted, I'm just going to quote the percentage that Mr. Green just gave us, Dr. Green just gave us that 14% of, 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 respondents were concerned that, that that starting elementary school was too early. They were concerned about that. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with some of it perhaps has to do with the early start kids being in the dark and cold early in the mornings and the dangers associated with being on the roadside in the dark. And I know, I know we've been fortunate and not had any untoward incidences along that line, but there is that concern on my behalf. And also, I have a concern about health care, I mean, child care. I know uh, we're providing uh, preschool and after school child care, but a lot of parents cannot, cannot arrange to have that done, and they depend upon their high schoolers or even middle schoolers to take care of the elementary school kids when, the, when they get home. And therefore, those elementary school kids may not have um, babysitters for at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half, when they after they arrive home, if they depend upon their 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 brothers and sisters to to care for them, so I'm concerned about that. Um, so I, I I just think that those are my concerns. Uh, I think it's a drastic change. It, there's a lot of change in this, and, and I'm I agree with everyone. I especially Dr. McMichael. It's just bad timing for this that we have to go through such a thing in the middle of this pandemic. But I want to say that it's going to impact a lot of people very suddenly and very drastically to flip times like we're doing. And it's, it may be a fool's errand that we're running here because school may not start anyway in August. It may very well be that. But I will say that if it does start, it's going to impact a lot of people. If you look at, the, if you look at the, some of the slides that Dr. Green presented, one that stood out, is that if you take elementary school teachers out of it, if you take them out, most of the responding questions are gonna be a lot closer to 50-50 than 60-40. Unfortunately, but I, and I, I think elementary school teachers have a, certainly um, a right to want more um, planning time and they have the right absolutely to to try to get the best for their students. But um, if you just take them out and they were a huge portion of the respondents, huge portion, you take them out, it's closer to 50-50, not 60-40. So I, I just wanna make those, those comments. Thank you. 
Dr. Huff, I appreciate those comments. I'd like to make a couple now too, if that's all right. Um, when this came up several years ago, when we were looking at uh, students and the, the safety concerns for elementary schools came up, I actually went out and drove around um, back roads and country roads and, and followed buses and at six o'clock in the morning. And what I saw was a lot of parents had their kids um, in their cars at the end of their driveways with the, with the heaters running. Um, waiting for the bus to come to put the child on the bus and and I saw parents where there were groups of children I saw adults there so I I really think parents take this seriously and as for the taking the elementary school teachers out I got phone calls from parents of elementary school teachers not not teachers I, I did get some emails and and some comments from elementary school teachers too but I got a lot of phone calls from parents of elementary school uh, children who say that um, their children are just wiped out by the time they get home and and it's different they, they were really in favor of um, the change in times so I, you know I, it, whatever we do there are going to be some folks that are going to be upset but if we don't do it now um, you know yes it's going to be hard it's like a lot of things we do but at the end of the day our concern is about educating these children and so this scenario seems to me to be the one that that we need to choose in order to give them the best education we have these elementary school students and the educations that they get are the foundation for what happens to them in middle and high school so it's imperative that these teachers have enough time for planning but it's also imperative that these kids can learn when they're there and and all the studies show that children learn better earlier in the day. So, you know, I don't know that there's a win-win here, but we got to do something. And this seems to me like the best thing to do. Does anybody else have any comments about this before we move on? I just wanted to make one comment, Lynn, this is Debbie. Yeah. Um, I did hear from um, some parents and I did hear from some bus drivers that with the younger students in the late getting off, that they've had to go back and wake them up to get them off the bus. That's a concern to me. And I know that I have, I have small children now, grandchildren, and, um, and I've heard from teachers as well. I've heard from parents as well. We're gonna have, they're gonna have to make a decision, uh, childcare in the morning or childcare in the afternoon. Uh, we have the Boys and Girls Club that's inexpensive for our, our, our parents and they can get sponsors to pay for their children if they can't afford daycare. So there are things in line for our students, but the concerns are me is that, you know, the teachers are saying two o'clock in the afternoon, these little elementary school, we're talking four and five year olds people. At two o'clock in the afternoon, they're spent and they're not done. So that's a concern for me. Um, and I'm, I am listening and I understand it's a change, but I, I do want to go back and say, we got to think about the kids and what's best for them. And I think the parents will be able to work it out. They've had to work it out through this COVID. So and it's not, and like you said, it's not going to be the best thing for everybody, but I'm thinking about these children and that, that bus driver telling me they had to wake up the kids to get them off the bus really concerns me and that's a late that's a long day for a little kid so just just my points thank you Debbie and and I want to add that on the uh when I was getting the information you know I had parents calling me of elementary kids and one of the concerns was brought up about um some of the high school uh teachers that said it would be it would be better for them if they're going to have to go in earlier and they could drop their kids off earlier before they went in or you know if we flipped it and they could drop their kids off their elementary kids off earlier if they were going later if we flipped it um but about the concern and and I told Dr. McMichael um and some of you that I talked to you I have reached out because my daughter is is a teacher in Nashville Tennessee their, their teachers have had nothing but great things to say about what they're doing out there and they've got a title one in a, a, a district that's like ours but they're a lot bigger than ours so I'm reaching out to their some of their board members, one of their board members were playing phone tag right now to see what they're doing and how they're partnering with their why and what they're doing. 
because evidently it's very successful and their teachers and their parents are liking it to see if maybe we can implement some of that here or how we can get funds or what we can do because there's no need to reinvent the wheel if they've already gone through those growth issues out there in Nashville and have a heavily Title I district and those things are working for them out there. If we can implement some of those things for our people here in Barrow. So I'm waiting to try and get those and I'll get the information back to Dr. McMichael once I get with that board member out there. So um, maybe that's something we can help our, our parents and our teachers with. Okay, good. All right, um, moving on, let's go to transportation, uh, excuse me, new business, security camera RFP, John St. Clair. Yes, thank you. Um, the superintendent recommends authorizing the purchase of security cameras from low bid respondent Tech Optics of Winder, Georgia, in the amount of $151,632.49. Uh, the district was awarded two uh, grants for security improvements by the state. A portion of the grant funds were designated for security camera replacements and additions uh, at schools. Uh, we were looking for internal cameras mostly and some external cameras. Uh, an RFP was posted and 16 vendors responded. <clears throat> uh, low bid respondent Tech Optics uh, met all the qualifications as usual and is not adversely listed in the SAM.gov database. Uh, I wanted to make a couple notes. The grant constraints only allow for hardware purchase. Um, so for replacement cameras, uh, ITS will do uh, the bulk of the replacing the outgoing camera with new camera. We're anywhere we're putting in new cameras where we need to put in cabling and new mounting. We'll have to do an RFP for installation services. And so we will be doing that uh, at the appropriate time and bringing it back to the board. Uh, cameras are being purchased for the following schools as listed. You'll note some schools are not represented. The, uh, the grant was broken down to a set amount per school. And if the funds for that school were used elsewhere, for instance, working on vestibules and so forth, and there wasn't enough left, then that school didn't have funds. We used, uh, we were constrained by not only the total dollar amount, but the amount per school. Um, the uh, financial impact, of course, would be $151,632 from security grant funds. All right, so can we put that on the consent agenda? Anybody have any questions? Okay, hearing none, can we put that on the consent agenda for Tuesday? Yes. Okay. yes anybody, ob let me do it this way. Does anybody object to putting it on the consent agenda? Okay, it's on there. Temporary <laughs> waiver of policy, GARK, Ms. Beggs. Yes, ma'am. We are requesting a waiver um, on policy GARK to allow employees who currently have accrued more than 30 days to roll over the excess days uh, through December of this year. Uh, currently, the policy requires that they be used prior to July 1. So uh, this is a temporary waiver that would just allow, uh, I think we have 38 employees currently who have 30 plus days and it's usually 34, 35, 36, somewhere in that range um, that uh, they would otherwise lose. Um, and given the, the circumstances right now, people have not been able to utilize that time. So that is our request. Okay. Any questions from anybody about that? Uh, Cindy, you broke up on me. Did you tell me how many uh, employees this was going to affect? Yes, we currently have about 38 employees who have more than 30 days accrued. Okay, so they'll have to use it by the end of the year, or the fiscal year. Right. Okay. The, the calendar year instead of- Yeah, the calendar, calendar year, calendar, I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. All right, uh, we'll put that on the consent agenda unless anybody objects. Hearing none, it's on the consent agenda. Okay, bus outsource repairs vendor, Dr. Green. Just in time, I got kicked off and barely made it back from my agenda. <laughs> um, so the superintendent recommends approval of the attached list of vendors for outsourced bus repairs. This is a little bit different than the way we typically do things. So let me take a few minutes to kind of walk you through that. 
Um, as I said earlier, we've currently got five mechanics and shop foremen to maintain a fleet of 208 school buses. Each bus has to be inspected every 20 days and serviced as needed. And sometimes because of timing, but, um, because of the extent of repair, we simply um, have to outsource the repairs of our buses in order to get them back in a timely manner. So we're requesting that a pool of vendors be approved to complete repairs in a timely uh, manner to keep our buses up and running. Some examples of where a pool is helpful for us is occasionally a vendor um, doesn't have a shop in which to repair buses, but does operate service trucks for in the field. We don't want every repair to be done in the field, but there's sometimes we really need a bus to be repaired in the field because it's not moving um, otherwise. There's also times when maybe a preferred uh, vendor um, for a particular repair may have several buses in line ahead of us from other districts and that sort of thing, and we need to get the bus repaired a little bit quicker than what that particular vendor is able to do. That's one of the reasons we're requesting a pool. Dr. McMichael, if you'll bring up that, um, that PDF right there. So the ones shaded in blue at the top, those are original equipment manufacturers and they are basically sole source for particular repairs. So they would be used for warranty work. They would be used for recall work. They'd be used in certain cases where the repair um, can only be done by the manufacturer of the original equipment. So those are, those are there and we're gonna have to use those as sole source when they're needed, but we put them there as a reference point for you. So we're really looking at the ones in that tannish colored underneath the blue. I'm not good at calling color names. Um, so these are aftermarket vendors and we have there um, a list of five we have their hourly rate to make the repair, their percentage markup on parts, their warranty that they give um, on the part, and then the warranty on the labor. And that last column is just to give you a sense of what kind of repair this company would be the preferred vendor for. But most of them can do any of the repairs we need, um, but we would go to them um, based on a combination of cost quality of service and turnaround time in that order. The lowest cost would be the biggest consideration, the quality of the service that we get from them on the types of repair we need done, and then the turnaround time so that we can keep our buses on the road in a timely fashion. So we would request that the board approve this pool of vendors listed here in this tan color for outsource repairs. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Yes, uh, Ken, this is Ricky. Uh, Peach State Freightliner, is that who we've been buying our buses from lately? Yes, sir. We've, we've, um, we've bought quite a number of buses through the years from Peach State. I'm on, I'm, this is the comment. It looks like they're the most expensive and, you know, we're buying buses from them. I, I would think they would, they could give us a little better price than that. Just my comment. Okay. All right, does anybody have any objection to putting this on the consent agenda? Yeah, let's wait on that. All right, consider it done. It's not on the consent agenda. Moving on. No, did anybody else have any questions? I think I gave everybody enough thing. Okay. Um, okay, cafeteria tables, Ms. Houston. All right, um, so the superintendent recommends awarding the cafeteria bid to Georgia Specialty Equipment and authorizing up to $80,062.34 to be spent on lunchroom tables at the newly renovated Westside Middle School and Statham Elementary School, um, and also for additional needs in the district. Um, so both Westside Middle School and Statham will, cafeterias will be renovated over the summer. The lunchroom tables will need to be replaced. Um, business services bid out the lunchroom tables and receive four vendors. Sample products were requested. We received sample tables from Georgia Specialty Equipment and Ernie Morris. Um, after a review with maintenance department, we recommended Georgia Specialty Equipment based on price, durability, quality, and overall value to the school district. So the low bidder um, was not able to get us a sample 
Um, Cable, well, nor could he give us any other school districts that used his product. So we feel more comfortable going with Georgia specialty equipment. So the financial impact, $60,062.34 will be paid for um, about 50 tables to go to Westside Middle School and Statham Elementary School. And then we're just asking for an additional $20,000 just if we have additional needs in the district then likely we'll use the used tables from Westside Middle School and Statham around the district. But um, if there is a need, we would like a little $20,000 buffer there um, for growth and replacement in the district. And that would be paid out of general fund. Okay. Any questions about the cafeteria tables? Now, is that the general fund, are you talking about from last year or from the, the budget that we hadn't even seen this year? Not know. Right, the budget that you haven't seen this year. Well, we could we could buy them in the next month. So that's what we're playing is, is if there is any needs in the next month, we would buy them. So it would be the 20, um, 20 budget. We have money in that in that line item for furniture. Um, we haven't spent a whole lot this year. So if we need it, I don't see much need here. But Judy wanted me to add a little bit just in case she gets any requests. I was going to say, because we hadn't seen them, we don't know what we're going to have to cut and stuff. I, I have an issue saying, yeah, let's go for it. And we don't even know what we're looking at. I don't know if anybody else does, but I mean, we don't know. I mean, that's not that much. But if you if we start adding more stuff to it. This is not out of our general fund, is it? Well, the 20000 would be if we add okay. more to it. Not the sixty thousand would come out of e loss, but the twenty thousand will be coming out of this next budget. We don't even. Okay. Well, I think we have to trust that they're not going to spend the money if, if, if we absolutely, if we absolutely, right. yeah. And and like I said, it, more than likely we would um, order them now, and it would come in before June thirtieth. Right, we'll be moving those things around before school starts. So, being that we're actually not going to be doing the budget in. On the, at a normal timing, um, that'll actually put it back further. And so we'll have a lot more chances to look over the budget going forward. Okay. Well, having said all that, we know that Jennifer Houston is not going to spend money we don't have and she's not comfortable with. So um, does anybody have any problems with putting that on the consent agenda? Okay. Fun millage rate, Ms. Houston. All right. Now I'll just sit back and get some popcorn and, and this little presentation here. Um, so are we doing spending resolution? Sorry, I got to jump oh, forward okay. there. There we go. I hate being in charge of the um, the PowerPoint and computer. So thank you for doing that. No problem. All right, um, before we begin this, I just wanna uh, remind you of how the process is usually done. Um, it should, in a normal year, we would have a tentative budget in place. Um, we would have, uh, our expenditures would be there. So we would know our state funding, we would know our expenditures and the millage rate um, close that gap between what the state funds and our expenditures. Um, this year is not a normal year. Um, we're not going to have, we're going to have a huge shortfall between the state funds and the expenditures. Um, the millage rate will not be able to fill that gap no matter what rate you give us. Um, however, it will help. Every penny helps. So um, you will see at the end of this presentation that the dates for approval are to be announced. Uh, we have a deadline that we can try to hang in um, and wait for a decision until the state funding comes in. Um, but it may not make it in time because we do have to get it to the county by the end of July. So um, with that being said, we're just gonna, just gonna move forward with the presentation. We'll talk more about that at the end. So um, property taxes, um, this is just an overview. Property taxes account for about 30% of our budget. Uh, we pay property taxes on land, buildings, vehicles, and personal property like boats and RVs and business inventory. All right, you can move on. So this is our property tax collections over the past 15 years. 
Um, you can see the ups and downs. Um, fiscal year 2020 is the last one. So that's 41.1 million that we've received so far. We budgeted 41 million 50,000. So we're are over budget on, on that. Normally we don't um, have the tax digest by the time we approve our, our tentative budget. So that was a guess was 41 million 50,000 and we're, we're getting pretty close to that. So 41.1 million, but you can see the ups and downs. We have still have three more months to collect for 2020, but we don't get much in these months. Um, we usually get it in November, December. All right, move on to the next slide. This is our title and ad valorem tax. So we always have to talk about this with local revenue. This is our um, new car tag. So um, this is the past seven and a half years because they didn't enact this tax until March of 2013. So you can see how it raised. Um, this is a calculation by the state. They keep a portion and distribute it out to the schools and municipalities. And in 2019, I believe they increased the amount that schools and municipalities got. And so we did receive quite a bump this year in 2020. Um, so that is that. We have a couple more months left and I don't, I don't think we're gonna get much in the next couple months, but, but we'll see. The property tax and the TABT tax collection. So this is both of them added together just so we would show apples to apples in the beginning months um, when the car tax was in with the property tax. So you'll see um, for fiscal year 2020, uh, $45 million is what we should be receiving in taxes. Dr. Matt. Um, this is an overview of the tax digest, which is 40% of the real property fair market value. Uh, the millage rate is voted on by the board each year. And um, we hold three public hearings on the tentative rate and then you guys pass a um, final rate. And our current millage rate is at 18.5. Right. Here we show the tax on a median home. I know there's been some debate on what the median home really is right now. Um, I just use the census data and thankfully that will be updated soon. But this is um, a medium uh, a tax on a median home value. Um, so on a $134,300 home, uh, the tax value is 53.720, so the tax at an 18.5 millage rate is $956.82. Like I said, this will be updated, so we'll be able to see um, the median home pretty soon once the census data is available. All right. This is um, tax di digest by fiscal year for the past 16 years. So this is the actual digest the value of the property on the digest. Um, and at the bottom, you can see that, you know, as our digest rose, so did our FTE and so did our buildings and so did our teachers and so did our SPED students. Um, so we've increased from 2007 to 2020, we've increased 2,842 FTE and um, 1,402 of those um, were SPED students. Um, we're projecting 15,297 FTEs for 2021, and that includes um, pre-K. Jennifer, can you, this is Butch Huff, can you extrapolate from that number for fiscal year 2021 of two, whatever it is, can you extrapolate from that number of just about what you think we'll get in terms of tax revenues this coming year? Oh, that's, yeah, we're going to make a decision on that pretty soon. Yep, I'll be able to show you, uh, um, depending on your decision, how much tax revenue we'll receive for that tax, tax digest, just in a okay. couple. Okay, all right, thank you. I'm ahead of you, thank you. It's okay. Um, this, is, this is just another graph showing the ups and downs of property value. So from 2020 uh, to fiscal year 2021, so the tax digest, digest that I just got increased by 6.56%. And then we'll move on to the next one. 
Um, this is our property tax income. So I estimated an 18.5% uh, 18.5 millage rate. And so if we used that rate on the 2020 um, one digest, we would receive $3,322 um, per FTE equivalent. Okay, this is just a picture of the tax digest that I get from um, Melinda Williams. Um, she retired by the way. So I think Jessica Garrett is taking her place. Um, is the tax digest and really um, we'll go into more detail of each line item on here um, to show how, how things have increased and decreased from last year to this year. So the next slide says um, what happened, the 2020 digest. Uh, the net digest increased by 6.6%. It went from 2.286 billion to 2.438 billion. Uh, the tax assessors reassessed property. Um, it's the property that was already on the tax digest and he reassessed that property. Uh, we had an increase of 62,591,000. Uh, the new real property, so the construction increased by 93,889,000. And our personal property, mostly business furniture, business inventory, that increased by $3.5 million. $3 million. And then we still have automobiles on the birthday tax, some of those older automobiles. Um, it decreased by $3.2 million, and we will continue to see that decrease until all those vehicles are gone. This next slide is the is, is my favorite. It just shows the uh, the ups and downs of the tax digest over the past um, six years. So um, if we the top line just shows you the previous year's value. Uh, what's in the red box is really what the um, the tax assessor uh, works with. So you can see the reassessments over the years. Uh, 65.69 million in 2014, all the way up to 220 million in 2015, 2016. We've talked about that before, where um, there was a lot, a lot of work done in the previous year, so uh, they had to clean up some things in 2016, 2017. 138 million in reassessments, 242 in 2018. Um, the tax assessor he retired at the end of 2018, but he was still there for another year working part-time. And that was in 2019 and 20. I think he, I think he maybe um, left the middle of 19. So those numbers are a little bit down because he was um, not full-time there. Uh, the real property, so this is the actual construction and commercial buildings and stuff that um, in 2014, $10.5 million. And we're at the all-time high right now um, in 2020 of 93 93,899,000 was added to the tax digest. Um, the ne next is just the personal property. This is hard to um, predict and explain. It's just that it's that um, business inventory. Um, so we never know how to predict that, but in, it increased um, $3.4 million this year. Our motor vehicles, these are the birthday tax, older, older, older cars. So you'll see a decrease every year in um, that value. Mobile homes, um, this year we had a significant increase in mobile homes. We had um, 28 new mobile homes um, added to Barrow County. Um, the timber went up this year, $8,900. Our exemptions on the, the reassessment. So this was property that was already on our um, tax digest that people got exemptions on. So they maybe they turned 62 or 65, or maybe their income went down. Um, this is also the homestead exemption. Uh, you know, we, we actually got a piece of land on Highway 53, so now it's non-taxable. So we kind of add to this number too. Um, exemptions on reassessments was uh, $9.2 million. That decreased our, our digest. Um, and then new exemptions, these are um, 
people just coming in and, and um, getting brand new exemptions on some of the newer property and just um, some things from to, to agriculture or to another type of um, exemption was 90 million. But our Freeport exemption, which is a Georgia law that offers manufacturers, distributors, wholesalers, and warehouse operations, a inventory tax exemption, um, 91 million of that went away. So the net value of the 90 and the 91 was just a $1.8 million um, reduction of our exemptions that actually helped. So our digest activity increased by 150 million, 51,931. All right, so the next slide shows um, the sales ratio study. So your defense when taxpayers say, um, when they come at us and they say that we're raising um, the taxes, we're not, technically raising the taxes. Our millage rate has stayed the same. Um, however, their values have increased significantly. Um, our is worth more. Um, in fact, it's worth even more than, it, than it's being assessed for right now because this sales to property value, um, the Department of Audits comes out and they compare actual sale of property to what it's listed for on the tax digest. Um, if it's the same, then they value it at a 40 because it's, they take 40% of both of them. And if they equal, then um, the tax assessor has assessed it properly and you're good. But every year, so in 2014, we were at 37.2, 2015, 38. We should be at 40 right there. Um, 2016 and 17, I think we were the lowest in the state at 35.65 and 35.64. We actually asked them to come out and re-audit because we thought the numbers were wrong, but they were they were pretty close. Um, then 2018, remember he um, reassessed more uh, more property and it went up to 38.13. But but you can see that some of the property, if we're still at 38, we're not at 40 or 41. So our, our, our values are not overpriced at all. They're, he's comparing with actual sales. Um, so if y'all want to go ever go into more detail of that so I can help you talk to your tax, uh, to your, um, uh, your people, then, then let me know. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's go to the next slide. I'm almost done, y'all. I promise. Um, the millage rollback is in effect. So um, a millage rollback is based on the reassessment of the property um, that was already on the digest for, and that's wrong, it's not 2020, 2019. So the, the, the property that was already on the digest for this year got reassessed. Um, it got reassessed by 62,591,567. So if we decrease our millage rate by 0.405 to 18.095 mills, then we would receive the same amount of tax money as the previous year on the property that was on the ta tax digest in 2019, excluding new exemptions. So they look at the digest and they see what rate would give you the same amount as last year, um, just on the old property, not the new property. And so if we don't go with the rollback, then we will have to um, advertise in the newspaper and do three, three public hearings and just let our taxpayers know what we're doing. The next slide shows our millage rate history. So you can see we've been consistent for the past 14 years and has have not raised our millage rate, 18.5. Um, of course, the Previous years, um, you can see those there too. We were a little bit lower at times, a little bit higher at times, quite a bit higher at times. And you can only go to 20 on the millage rate before you'll have to get the public to vote in a school bond. The next slides, we're going to do some um, comparisons to other districts that are like us or near us. So um, this is the school millage rates um, from for last year, 2019. So uh, Barrow, we're right there in the middle at 18.5. Oconee is below us at 16.5. Uh, Clark is at 20. Uh, Walton has a school bond, so they're at 20.9. And Jackson has a school bond at 20.5. 
21.355 millidray. All right, the next slide is, um, I get this, these numbers from the Georgia Department of Education. They give out the local revenue. So this is things like um, property taxes, TABT tax, transfer tax, and tangible taxes, other local revenue that we have like rental income and stuff like that. And then they divide by the FTE. So for 2019, here is Barrow County along with um, counties, uh, districts that are like us or, or near us. So um, our local revenue per FTE for 2019 was 3,186. Um, you see Walton there at 3,699. Um, even though, uh, where is Oconee? Even though Oconee has a, has a lower tax rate than us, they make $4,511 per FTE because they have less students than we do. So they can have a lower tax value, um, tax or, or tax digest. Um, no, I'm not even saying tax digest. They can have a lower millage rate because one, they have uh, their property is, is, is a lot more than ours. And then second um, is they have less students. All right, then, and then the last comparison before we get to the decision is the expenditures per FTE. So. Uh, we can't spend it unless we make it. So here Barrow County is at 9,237 per FTE. Um, Walton, 9,690. Um, the county's right there next to Walton. And then, you know, there's the, the different um, amounts that, that the districts pay per FTE on their students. Jennifer, um, butch up butch again. Up again. Historically, have our expenditures gone down? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Have expenditures gone down over the last years, two, three years that we spend? No, no. We've gotten more students, more um, teachers. So our expenditures have gone up. Um, I do do a graph of showing our expenditures per FTE, and I don't believe that's gone down either. I think it's just increased with um, the amount of um, uh, resources that we've been able to put back into the classroom since the recession. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. How, is the expenditures per FTE gone down? Right. No, um, I don't believe they have. Um, again, we were so low during the recession of what we, we could put into the classroom and put out per FTE. So we, we've come up some on that. Okay. Good. Okay, so we're finally to the decision. So um, this is what I give you here. And um, we were able to get the um, tax digest before we do the budget. So we um, budgeted an 18.5 millage rate. Uh, the first column is the 2020 actual. So the 2020 actual brought us in 40,198,000 or, or that's what the budget, um, or that's what uh, it's supposed to bring in. I think it's bringing in a little bit more. Um, so for our 2021 budget, uh, we budgeted based on the actual tax digest that was given to us and an 18.5. So we will be budgeting $42,196,591.50. Um, for property tax revenue, unless you determine you want to uh, move the millage rate. So I do different scenarios across the board. Um, down at the bottom, I do, and um, how much, if you can just scroll up just a little bit, Dr. McMichael, um, at the very bottom, you'll see how much this will um, adjust somebody's property taxes. So on a $200,000 home, um, someone pays $1,443 on school tax. If we lower the millage rate to 18, that third column over, they will, um, they will uh, reduce their, their tax by $39. It would also reduce our revenue by $1,140,000. Different scenarios. And they'll that, still complain that their taxes are too high. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, definitely. So Can I? <laughs> anybody wanna look at any specific, I went up to 20 mils. Um, 
just just to show you how much um, that would be. And that would be a, a, you can't see it on your screen. I can't see it because I don't have glasses, but the 20 mils would increase our revenue by um, 3.4 million. And it would increase a, a $200,000 home tax by $117. Per Jennifer, um, I know we're getting a 14% cut from the state. Any other anticipated significant cuts that you think we're going to see? I, I know the the car the car thing is going to drop. Any, there was nothing else being cut much, was there? We don't have many revenue sources. You know, we have property taxes, we have car taxes, and we have state funds. Um, right. Everything else, we have some grants, but they're state funded. So yeah, they're probably going to drop too. But we don't spend our grants unless. <laughs> receive it. So, you know, um, everyone would, will adjust to whatever we receive, but um, it's really the, on the, on the capital project side, we may, we may lose some on the um, e-lost revenues, the sales tax revenues over there for sure. Um, but we have a ways to go before we have to worry because we've built up a good balance over there. And, um, Tom Owens has been such a great financial assistant and he makes sure that we, we are bringing in enough ELOS funds uh, to cover our debt service over there. Do we know what the 14%, what that actual number may be close to? Yeah, so we feel like it is going to be um, $13,000. How much? I'm sorry. $13 million. $13 million, $13 million. okay. Mm -hmm. I see. So, this is where this is the point where I I don't know if y'all want to wait until to to see if we can wait to see if we get the state funds in. Um, you're not going to fill the gap with the millage rate. So, if you don't feel comfortable uh, going over a certain amount, let's knock those out and say no. We don't want to do that. You don't feel comfortable going down with the millage rate. So, <laughs> <without>. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't either. Jennifer, this is Ricky. Uh, I saw an interview over the last week or two when the governor was talking about cutting the budget that he was going to do all he could do to protect education. Now, what that means, uh, I don't know. Uh, I could give him some suggestions. He could do a tobacco tax. He could close some loopholes in the tax. Uh, but anyway, I don't need to be saying that on here. <laughs> well, I hope I hope he's just true to his word, and this isn't as drastic as maybe we. And, and maybe maybe the federal government. I think Dr. Mack. Yeah, is about to say it, you know, maybe the federal government will come in and do their part too and, and supplement. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth. Hopefully they'll do what they, what they were created to do. And, and yeah, good luck. luck. But um, we, we, we will wait and hold our breath until that happens. Um, but my fear with the federal government, the shekels follows the shackles. That red tape. Yep. Uh, well, yeah, they're going to tell you what hmm, they're going to, they're going, they're going to put handcuffs on with what we do with it, too. Yeah. Jennifer, when, when do we have to decide on a millage rate? When is that? Um, you have to decide on a millage rate. So we have to get it to the Board of Commissioners by July 28th, and that is asking them to do a special meeting. So um, we have to decide on a tentative millage rate by July 1st. For that to happen so that's a full month um we can decide on june 25th and i'm still real comfortable and in the and the board will get the board of commissioners will get their um report from us so they can vote on it um in plenty of time or decide on it next week and that gives me plenty of time to to get the millage rate all the public hearings done and the and the advertisements done yeah but we need the budget don't we we do, and we'll budget at the 18.5, and then um, if y'all do something different, then, um, yeah, we need to, we probably need to know this number before we budget. That would be better. All 
All right, so um, this is just the advertisement. If we go with an eight, I, I just did a draft. If we went with the 18.5, this is just something I have to put in the newspaper that you'll see. Um, and it just shows the five year history of um, taxes and the tax digest. And then that's the end of my presentation. And um, now you kind of just have to, if y'all are ready to, ready to decide when, when you want me to bring this back to you for a, for a tentative vote so I can move on with the um, public hearings. I could bring it back to you next week on June 2nd, or I could bring it back to you at the work session in June on June 25th. I'd, I'd rather it be brought back on the 25th myself, give us more time. Wait a minute, I don't have, you don't have a work session. June 25th, June 16th. June when? June 16th will be that a- would be, That would be better. Is that okay? Perfect. Yeah. Hey, I'm gonna, let me break in. Is everybody good, is everybody good with June 16th? Okay. I'm not hearing anything, so I take it it's okay. Anybody opposed to June 16th? Okay, very good. I, I, don't, I don't think the numbers are gonna change drastically, do you? Yeah, I don't have any reason to, to change. So, I mean, I know what I'm good with. So it's up to you guys. I think we ought to think about it. Let's, let's go June 16th. I, I agree. It's probably not going to change, but something may, something may happen. I don't know. Let's just wait till June 16th. I'm good with that. Maybe by then we'll have a better handle what kind of help we're going to get from the, the feds on this too. Yeah, that will give us a little window. Jennifer, is that, is governor, that good for you? It's something. Like Ricky said, the governor's made some comments. I don't know what it means either, but let's just wait and see. Yeah, we're supposed to be getting a little information from the DOE and the state that's Friday or Monday. I'm okay. not sure if it'll have anything to do with this directly or not, but you know that's kind of the way things have been coming out for us. It's just a little bit at a time, so... So and that was, with the six the Jennifer, if that works for Jennifer. That works for me. Very good. That gives me plenty of time. Okay, good. All right. Well, okay. We will right. we'll go with that. Okay. I have lost uh, my computer usage account when my battery died, and so I'm on document Michael's cell phone at the moment. So he's going to keep walking us through, and then I'll call for votes, and we'll, we'll do it in place. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. No problem. So our next uh, piece here is uh, the FY 2021 budget spending resolutions. And Jennifer, you're still up. So, so as we continue to talk about, um, we are not going to have our state funds um, in order to produce a budget for you guys to pass. So uh, the superintendent recommends adopting a spending resolution for the month of July 2020. Um, COVID-19 has had a significant impact on the state of Georgia. Georgia has suffered financially and those losses are presumed to flow down to the school system funding. Another consequence is a delay in the school system receiving their state allotment of funds for fiscal year 2021. At this time, in order to continue operations when a school board cannot adopt a budget prior to July 1st, it must adopt a spending resolution which authorizes the superintendent to spend funds in the new fiscal year until the budget is adopted. A spending resolution is only authorized for one month and is limited to expend one twelfth of the prior year's budget um, for all funds. So um, I have a worksheet there that, um, yep, that's it, that shows all of our different funds and the um, budget on them. So this would allow the district to spend, the superintendent to spend $13,079,381 in the month of July. Um, there's a resolution that y'all will sign, that uh, Ms. Stevens and um, Dr. McMichael will sign on June 2nd, if you agree with this. If you don't agree with this, then we'll have to cease operations and close down. So. <laughs> um, <I'll> have, <laughs> do y'all have any questions or anything else I can help you um, understand with this and feel better about it? Because we've never 13 million. 
<laughs> you have such a great way of putting things so succinctly. Thank you. Um, all right. Does anybody have any questions? We know we're going to have to do this, though. So. All right. Hearing none. Do you want this on the consent agenda? Was anyone, anybody yeah. to this on the consent agenda? I, I just I don't yeah. have I don't want to put uh, yeah I want to put it on a consent agenda. I'm just uh what's the time frame for this? I gotta sign it. You have I to mean, sign when do we need to vote on this? You yeah. have to vote on it before June 30th. Okay. Before then okay. start. That's regular meeting. So we can wait till the, the regular yeah. meeting. Okay. Good yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah, we're good. All right. Okay. All right. Well, we'll move on then. Now we're uh, actually done with the, the public section of this uh, meeting. And uh, so we'll need a uh, vote to go into executive session. Probably the easiest thing for, to do is if you, board members, if you'll just say your name and yes or no. Ricky Bailey, yes. Beverly Kelly, yes. Lisa yes. Maloof, yes. Debbie Krause, yes. Barry Hubbard, yes. Okay. Bill Ritter, yes. Lynn Stevens, yes. All right, Jordan. Jordan Ripper, yes. All right, that, I think that's got everyone. All right, we're going to take just a second and cut off the live feed and throw some people out of the room, and we will start back in just one minute here. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, everybody. Yes, Thanks thank you, lot. Jennifer. Great job. I don't know. I'm just wandering around. Uh,